Good afternoon to all. Uh, I welcome you uh, to the session EU-Africa Partnership, a new start. Uh, let me first thank uh, my colleague at CEPS uh, for the great organization of this uh, version of the 2021 virtual uh, edition of the Ideas Lab, and also the Euro-Mediterranean Economist Association, one of the co-sponsors of the Ideas Lab this year, for their support uh, in the co-organization of this session. Uh, at EMEA, uh, the Euro-Mediterranean and Africa Partnership and Integration, so regional integration, is one of the key policy research initiatives that we are pleased to collaborate with SEPS uh, via the Trigger Project and also the uh, Euro-Mediterranean Network for Economic Studies uh, that we have developed over the past five years and other initiatives that we are uh, together working on. Uh, I would like to start this uh, panel discussion with a brief introduction to put uh, this discussion within a context where we are uh, today. First of all, uh, let's not forget that the EU-Africa partnership uh, dates back to decades. And I would like uh, to emphasize a few uh, milestones dates. Uh, starting with 2007, these are many years ago, uh, at the EU-Africa uh, summit in Lisbon, uh, both continents uh, declared their willingness to move beyond a donor-recipient uh, relationship. This is key uh, in the partnership. Of course, here uh, the EU and the African Union jointly identified together uh, mutual and complementary interests and to move away from this traditional relationship uh, toward a real partnership uh, based on equality, mutual understanding and uh, recognition, uh, and also encouraging a full inclusion of migrant communities and diaspora. So this is really what in 2007, and I think this is a key, uh, at least, uh, uh, commitment. As a result uh, of that uh, joint Africa-EU strategy, an action plan was, an action plan was uh, launched, uh, and since 2008, uh, and implemented for uh, some successive periods of uh, two years uh, up to uh, 2018. So these are really uh, what I call the implementation of this uh, partnership since then. Now, uh, after 10 years since the adoption of this first joint uh, Africa EU strategy uh, in Lisbon, uh, the fifth uh, African Union EU summit in 2018 in Abidjan focused on investing in youth for sustainable future. This is all the history, in fact, uh, before uh, the COVID-19 uh, you know, uh, uh, shock that we have gone through, or we are still going through. Now, the joint declaration back then in 2018 um, emphasized the importance to reinforce uh, a mutually beneficial partnership, uh, African Union and EU, and also the tri trilateral cooperation between the African Union, the European Union, and the United Nations. So of course, there were some strategic priorities, uh, and I want to state them there. Uh, it's investing in people, education, science, technology, and skills development. This is essential for development. Strengthening resilience, peace, security, governance, migration, mobility, and very importantly, mobilizing investment for African structural sustainable transformation. So this was in 2018. Of course, everything uh, went completely changed uh, at the start of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. That was, of course, in March uh, 2020. Now, in March 2020, the president of the European Commission and the high representative uh, uh, for foreign affairs and security policy announced the proposal for a new comprehensive strategy with Africa, so going beyond building on a partnership uh, on five key areas. Green transition and energy access, digital transformation, sustainable growth and jobs, peace and governance, migration and mobility. Also, uh, I would like to emphasize and point that the EU recognized the importance of strengthening the political, cultural, and economic ties between the two continents in a multipolar world. So this is a clear recognition that there are other actors who are also, in a way, competing in uh, Africa and also uh, for their own interests. This will give more leverage, of course, uh, to both continents, EU and African Union, uh, at the international scene. 
Now, uh, after this, just a few months ago in February, the EU published a joint uh, communication on the renewed partnership with the Southern Neighborhood, uh, proposing the new agenda for Mediterranean to relaunch uh, the cooperation uh, and realize the untapped potential uh, the region, of the region after a recognized failure of the uh, Barcelona uh, process. Now, the agenda proposed five main uh, areas of action, human development, good governance and rule of law, strengthening resilience, building prosperity, and also uh, seizing the uh, opportunities in the digital transition, peace, security, migration, mobility, and green transition, climate resilience, energy, and um, environment. Now, the new agenda stresses also uh, the importance to increase cooperation uh, between North and Sub-Saharan Africa as a triangular cooperation with the European Union. Uh, in April 2021, the new Cotonou Partnership Agreement maintained a common foundation setting uh, based on six strategic priorities, again, within the same overall uh, thinking uh, of human rights, democracy, governance, peace and security, human and social development, environmental sustainability and climate change, inclusive and sustainable economic growth and development, migration and mobility. So generally, all those, uh, I would say, strategic objectives are aligned. Uh, now, uh, to achieve these very ambitious uh, objectives, and of course, ambitious more on the implementation uh, side of the European Union and its partners, the multi uh, annual financial framework for 2021, 2020, sorry, 2027 approved, was approved uh, in uh, December 2020 merges most of the existing instrument there were a lot uh, into one single big instrument called the neighborhood development and international cooperation instrument so uh, well known as ndg so this framework allocates for uh, sub-saharan africa uh, and also the neighborhood under this ndg uh, more around, I would say, uh, 50 billion uh, euros over this uh, period of time. Uh, during the COVID-19, we've seen a lot of developments over this year. And one key development is uh, the emphasizing the role of the private sector for financing development, uh, which, in fact, has been pushed by the international community, for example, in the whole debate, uh, that you all are aware of on the debt uh, relief. So, of course, uh, having uh, the private sector contributing to the blending uh, or, and of the instrument and contributing to the financial, uh, the financial uh, effort of the European Union in this sense. Now, the European Union has already a very vast experience in blending facilities since actually 2007 with the EU uh, Africa Infrastructure Trust Fund, uh, also the Neighborhood Investment Facility. And uh, most recently, in 2016, there has been this uh, EU platform for blending in external cooperation. No, that was before 2016. In 2016, you had uh, the uh, external investment plan, uh, particularly uh, encouraging the investment in African EU neighborhood. But now, all of this is there. I mean, it's working in certain manners, uh, and I think we can listen more to uh, our uh, panelists today uh, talking about it and see how it, it in practice, how it works. Um, so there are also um, other, uh, other uh, instruments which, uh, in fact, are based on this uh, European Fund for Sustainable Development, which is now moving into uh, under the MMF, uh, which is a multi uh, financial framework, uh, which is uh, the Euro uh, European European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, uh, and also would be uh, the one of the main instruments of EU cooperation with partners countries. Uh, so it is clear that uh, today we are experiencing a lot of changes, not only from a I would say transition uh, point of view, digital transition, green transition, and also can also see some changes within the EU institutional setting, uh, which also reflects uh, very much the new geopolitical commission of emphasis uh, on the role of international partnership for building a stronger EU role in the global fight for poverty and the SDGs uh, promotion. 
Um, so looking at this challenging context as well of the added uh, by the COVID-19, you can see that the uh, southern neighborhood and also uh, the Africa has been very weakly prepared uh, for uh, 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 facing the pandemic and also this hampers their capability or capacity to uh, have a, uh, a resilient uh, path for growth and development going forward. So there are many questions, uh, in fact, that uh, could be posed in this uh, new context uh, or challenging context that we are living in. One is, are we moving uh, toward a completely new uh, financing development policy of the EU in the continent? Is it going to be based on this type of guarantees, blending instrument? And who will be the partners, in fact, in the target countries and who will be monitoring uh, those new developments? Now, of course, Africa is not one homogeneous group. Uh, Africa has different types of countries and there are the African lower income countries and fragile states, but they need much more for development and most probably might not be yet ready for this new change uh, of, uh, of, of the approach uh, to the continent. And uh, also we can, based on you know, what I uh, shared with you, is that there are many uh, frameworks and of course they are targeted, but probably need some more coordination between the institutions themselves uh, with all the institutions that are uh, dealing with EU uh, in the continent. So, and also in terms of the, uh, in terms of the um, international cooperation. So these are some of the questions uh, we, can, uh, we can discuss during the panel. So let me uh, start and to warmly welcome our panelists today. I'll start with Sandra Kramer, she's the director of the EU uh, 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 African Union relationship, West and East Africa, at the uh, International Partnership Directorate General at the European Commission. Uh, Maria, <coughs> Maria Show Berrigan, who is the director of the department in the European Investment Bank uh, that deals with all the lending operations in Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, Asia, and Latin America. Um, and uh, the EIB, as you all know, is the bank of the European Union, and its uh, main uh, uh, mission, is, mission is lending activity outside the EU and also support EU policies and priorities uh, for the external action. And third, um, Christian Koft, who is the head of fixed income at the Union Investment Group, a leading a German uh, asset manager, Christian, he's also a member of the advisory group at the ECB, um, Bond Market Contact Group, and EIB, uh, the Chief Economist Advisor Group, and also a, a member of the Asset Management and Investment Council Executive Committee. So he has worked a lot on, for example, GDP-linked uh, sovereign bonds, and then he did a lot of other uh, work also, uh, among others, with the Center for European Policy Studies, SEPS. So I would like to uh, start uh, and kick off this uh, discussion uh, with Sandra. So Sandra, please tell us what uh, INPA is doing now and how you operationalize your activities in uh, the Africa uh, region. Thank you. Thank you, Rim. Uh, can I just ask you, can you hear me? Very well. All right, good, because we had some technical difficulties, but uh, thank you very, very much. Rim, good to see you. Maria, good to see you. Uh, and a uh, lot of uh, old friends also online, Constance and Carol, and of course, uh, Sam, Bilal. I haven't seen you for ages, all of you, but it's very good to be connected. So really welcome everyone. If there are connection problems, please signal it to me somehow because it, uh, I will turn off my camera. So thanks for organizing. Uh, look, we have a good panel. We don't have the African side. We have already discussed that. It's a pity because if you want to have an equal partnership, which is what we want, we need to have, uh, of course, uh, all sides. We will, of course, uh, you know, always keep that in mind. Um, now, the my title, this is also a new start and you're 
title of the panel is New Start, um, is now Director Africa because we've actually merged the two Africa directors into one. And I'm now lucky to be uh, responsible for all uh, Sub-Sahara Africa. So uh, again, many, many thanks. And this is in many ways indeed a new start, Rim. Uh, this geopolitical commission under the chair of Ursula von der Leyen came into office, declared itself a geopolitical commission and really started well by also declaring Africa as a strategic priority, as you know. And her very first trip abroad outside the European Union was to the Africa Union in Addis Abeba. And that was four days after she took office. So she really uh, put uh, uh, the, she, you know, that immediately into action. She also renamed the portfolio of my commissioner, Jutta Erpilainen, as Commissioner for International Partnerships. And that is a new start in itself. And the mission letter to Jutta Erpilainen, she asks, um, can you look at the European model for development? Can you see that you make it more strategic, more value added, more effective, and also more in line with the European policy priorities? Now, with that, and also uh, seeing a world which is increasingly complex and where there are indeed increasingly com competing models, as you already referred to him, there is definitely um, the need for um, Europe to be more assertive in this world. Um, we are always, uh, for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but across Asia and Latin America as well, the largest or one of the largest trading partners, foreign direct investment partners, development partners and humanitarian aid partners. Um, we need to see within the European Union altogether what it is that we stand for and what it is that we stand up for. And I think there's three things here. First of all, we stand for the values of the European Union and that underpins everything we do. Democracy, rule of law, human rights, that is what we stand for and stand up for. Um, secondly, very importantly, and I think it's a unique selling point we have vis-a-vis -vis other competing models as well, it's sustainability in everything we do, be it social, be it environmental or economic or financial or political, what we do is sustainable. It's not piling debt upon debt. We will look at environmental consequences and we will look at the issue of decent jobs for the people uh, where we work in the partner countries. So I think that is something that makes us stand out. And in that sense, this is uh, a very big difference. Of course, the compass for all this, number three, is the sustainable development goals. This will lead us in what we do. Um, we looked on how to translate this into DG international partnerships. And obviously, this is more than a name change. This is a, a real shift, a new start of a very different relationship. You have already looked at the donor recipient. You mentioned it. We have rigorously moved away from that. That was done. Equal partnerships with responsibilities on both sides of the equations. That we know. But what we have done now is to say in DG International Partnerships and the way we work, policy first. I.e. we're not going to be led by money, but led by choices of policy. Green transition, responsible digitalization, the creation of jobs, education, vocational training, uh, all this is what leads us and that lines up with the policy priorities of this European Commission. Secondly is geographization and you can see it in Ndiki, which by the way is a strange name and we all know that, but it is now uh, called Global Europe as well uh, because the European Parliament helped everyone in my view by giving it a much better name. So it's called Global Europe, and I think uh, that's uh, much better. So geographization, if you look at how Indiki is structured, Global Europe, it is that most of the funding is geographized, i.e. it lands in a country or in a region. Now, that's number two, how we changed INTPA. Number three is the way we work, a co-creating way of working. It's not as if Africa which I'm very lucky to be the director, is doing this on its own in a bubble. And I see a lot of Maria and I'm happy with that. But what I would also like to do is to see my, my colleagues within the commission who deal with agriculture or transport or uh, energy or digital. So the whole of commission approach is extremely important. And what's equally important is the member states. 
and you know about our Team Europe approach, how we, how we really move hand in hand and how we bring Team Europe initiatives to, to our partnerships, where we focus on particular themes and where all member states come together as a big puzzle to make a transformational impact on one or two particular things in a country, rather than spending a, a lot of money on unconnected, unfocused uh, projects that do not make the change most of the time. So this new way of co-creation is, is a new start. Now, it's a good timing because this is still a relatively new uh, commission. Uh, it's also a new budgetary cycle, as you mentioned, 2021 to 2027. And it is time for um, a global recovery, which is going to have to be green and just and digital, and which affects really all of us. And I think that we have the right ways to go about it. We have also a new US administration, which I think should be mentioned as hopefully a positive factor in all this. Now, on Global Europe, you have seen what that instrument is. And by the way, next week it will be adopted officially um, uh, by the European Parliament, European Council. So next week you will see uh, a press release and, and all that just to celebrate and to mark the moment that finally, after all these negotiations, Global Europe is a fact. It's much simplified. It is streamlined because it takes eight, nine, ten budget lines and puts it into one. It also is not making a distinction between Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa, which was the case in the past and which was really a bureaucratic hindrance of our work. Um, it's very responsive because it has a rapid reaction pillar, but it also has a cushion where we can tap out of in case of need. And, you know, every there was lots of discussions whether that was too big, etc. But it's uh, the global pandemic that woke everyone up. No one saw it coming and we needed it uh, very much. So um, there's also more, of course, transparency and democratic scrutiny because it is no longer outside of the budget, like the European Development Fund was. It is fair and square within the budget. So programming of all that is ongoing as we speak nationally, uh, regionally, and looking at these policy priorities and looking what it is that we want to do in these countries. And obviously uh, you're focusing a lot on the blending and the guarantees, uh, which we will do under, <coughs> sorry, under the EFSD plus, and um, I will not dwell too much. I know Maria and Christian will probably come into that as well. Um, but I think there are two important things that we need to focus on now. One is the global recovery. For that, we need, first of all, debt relief. And the European Commission has done it very much, including the member states, to make that possible and to give that fiscal space uh, to governments in our partner countries. Uh, two are the concessional loans, the blending, uh, which is very, very important and where we work hand in hand with the EIB and many other uh, uh, institutes and organizations to make that happen. Three is the private sector, because RIM, we can, you know, our ODA money is not going to make the difference. It's not. It's less than what comes in as remittances. It, it's much less than what comes in on foreign direct investments. If we want to make a change for a more peaceful and prosperous world, we need the private sector to come in. So I'm looking forward to Christian to come into that. There's also domestic resource mobilization. We need to collect better taxes and we need to spend it better. And that is something that we focus on as well with uh, programs on public finance management, et cetera, to make sure that that happens. So that's the global recovery. The second point that we really need to focus on is vaccines. Because, you know, we're all thinking, we're nearly there, light at the end of the tunnel, we're going to have a nice summer. The thing is, that it's not enough. We have done a lot through COVAX. Uh, the EU and the member states have 2.5 trillion funded into COVAX. And as President von der Leyen said during the Global Health Summit, we produce a lot of vaccines in the European Union. 50% we export, we, we give away, we donate. So we are, she called it the pharmacy of the world, but really, really important that we mark that. Of course, we have a set the vaccine sharing mechanism and we're looking at uh, manufacturing and, and hoping that uh, that uh, as President von der Leyen announced. We can come to uh, manufacturing in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's not for now, of course not, but it will be for the next pandemic. So 
as a conclusion, Rim, because I have been speaking too long already, this is a new start in many ways, and I hope I came to a little bit, I pointed to some of the new starts. We are moving also to the EU-AU summit, which will take place early 2022, physically, hopefully in Brussels, I think, yes, in Brussels. And what we are looking forward to is to make an investment package. This is what the European Council asked us to do. And that investment package, of course, focuses on the policy priorities that I mentioned and that you mentioned as well. Of course, with youth and with women and with education as cross-cutting issues and with a focus on the fragile countries. So with that, I give it back to you. I hope I gave you uh, a good overview of what DG International Partnerships is, does, and how we uh, have made a new start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, San at least it's really refreshing when I hear uh, that the new start is anchored in co-creation, uh, coordination, or better coordination, and of course, a new budget, which has to go there. But you said something very important is transparency and scrutiny. This is essential for any action that is done anywhere. And I think uh, we are needing more accountability, particularly to account for the citizens everywhere uh, where they are uh, in Africa or also in the, in the, European, uh, in the European Union. Now, of course, uh, you mentioned a global recovery. Of course, global recovery has many uncertain uh, aspects to it, and uh, we can still see it. So, of course, um, uh, we are hoping that the macroeconomic scenario is still benign, so where the interest rates are low and, you know, we continue into really moving out from, uh, from this stressful, distressed situation uh, globally. Uh, but yes, I absolutely agree with you about the debt relief. But again, there is a whole debate now between the low-income countries and middle-income countries. So to what extent also middle-income countries, they will have to get into this debt relief uh, dynamic. Uh, and you also mentioned the private sector, which I absolutely agree. Still, uh, the private sector is, is in a way uh, reluctant to get into this process because of the complication of uh, uh, the whole process of debt relief and restructuring, and the, especially for countries who are already uh, financing themselves in the market. Uh, the vaccines, I, <laughs> I, I agree with you, but then if we look at the data in Africa, Sandra, it's very, they are going very slow on the vaccination uh, process. Uh, it is also hampered by uh, big problems on the logistics, uh, on the distribution also of the vaccine. And I, I, I think this is going to be a big challenge uh, going forward. Um, Say, so yes, I. I, I, I hear that this is a new start, but this is going to be a new uh, bumpy start uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 and other, uh, I would say, legacy, structural legacy issues, which in reality, they are hampering the recovery to go faster. Now, I'd like to go uh, straight to Maria. Maria, you are the EIB, so tell us, please, what you have been on the ground suffering from. Please, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I was listening to Sandra and I was thinking, you're going to hear from me more or less the same words, probably with a different music, because it's going to be a bit more financial type of music, but it's, it's really very, very, very much aligned, you will see. So let me tell you, you know, you asked me to, to reflect and, and to explain about the role of the EIB and also how we see things changing and, and how the, our, our role will change in the context of this current multi-annual financial framework because it started already already in January. And in terms of what's the role of the EIB, we are the Bank of the EU. I think this is really what is going to define everything. It is the defining element because our mission comes from the Treaty of Rome. So we were created when the rest of the European Union institutions were created. At the time, it was not even the European Union as such. And already since 1963, EU member states decided that the EIB should have an external dimension, that we should be working outside the Union. At the time, it was in the Africa, Caribbean, Pacific region, and then in the neighborhood, so in the, in the southern neighborhood, which is the topic of today as well, we have been active for more than 40 years. So it is 
because the EU member states have wanted the EIB to be active in these regions that we have been deploying our activity. And this activity has been following the different mandates that we were receiving from EU member states and from the European Commission. In particular last year, and last year was a tough year for everyone, it was very tough in Africa, we achieved record lending levels uh, in, in Africa, in the continent. And this was more than 5 billion euro of lending, half of which was for the private sector. And let me explain that 5 billion euro of lending of the EIB means that we mobilized between 12 and 15 billion euro of investments because we always co-finance with somebody else. There is always much more because we never finance more than 50% of the project costs. And interestingly, 70% of these investments, in, in particular the ones in Sub-Saharan Africa, are set to benefit least developed countries and fragile states. So things are changing even on this. We were given the policy priority of concentrating in fragile states and least developed countries, and this is happening already. But let me come back to what it means to be the EU bank. The first thing is that we only have EU member states and the European Commission in our governance. And that we follow EU priorities and, and the policy priorities, but also the political priorities. And this is important at times where other MDBs maybe are subject to pressures of because they have China in their shareholding, for example. We don't, we don't have that. So we know what it is that we are standing for and therefore, you know, the, these pressures for, to support Chinese contractors in, 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 in public procurement, it is not uh, for the EIB. Being the EU bank also means that we work with EU values and that our vision for development is the same as the one of the European Union. And therefore, what Shanda has just been explaining, it's about a sustainable and an inclusive development. And here, let me be specific about a number of points. The first one would be our gender focus. It is right now top priority for European Union member states that the activities that the EU is carrying out outside are taking into consideration the gender angle into all our activities. You will have read that in, in a DG, in Global Europe, 80% of the activities need to have a gender angle. It's even higher than the percentage that has been set for climate. And this is something that we have completely interiorized. We are applying best practices with regard to, to gender, uh, delivering on SDG 5 and empowering women and girls. And this both on economic empowerment, but also with regard to access to services and to and to assets. So it's not just about access to finance, which is already a major thing. If you're a woman and you're an entrepreneur in sub-Saharan Africa, your capacity, your ability to have access to the restricted uh, finance that is available is going to be much more difficult than that of a, of a man. But it's about equitable access to financing, to resources, it's about removing barriers for, for women and it's about unlocking their growth potential. And then this is where also girls come in because it's about making sure that girls have access to education so that they can be part, they can be actors in the development of their countries and of their environment. So we have mainstreamed gender in all of our operations. And this means that for all of our operations, we're looking at what is the impact on women and girls and how can we make sure that it is a, a distinctly positive impact for women and girls. But there are more things that, that it means to be applying EU values. And it is also about the environmental and the social analysis that we carry out in our projects. It's about our views on debt sustainability. Sandra has mentioned this as well. And it's about our views on the respect of human rights. Here, I just want to mention that this week we have launched a public consultation on the review of the EIB's environmental and social standards. So we will very much look forward to inputs from practitioners, from beneficiaries, from civil society, from the countries that we are serving, but also from uh, European Union citizens. We want to hear what is expected from the EU Bank on environmental and social standards. 
And, and this is then leading to tough choices. Eh? And Sandra knows very well, we recently have had a case of a hydropower project in, in a country in West Africa. I will not say which one it is. It is a very important hydropower plant. It is green energy. It would be the typical project that the EIB would want to be involved in. But this project is going to have major effects on biodiversity, including on, mit on protected species, and these effects, unfortunately, cannot be mitigated. It will also have major displacement of population. And we have concerns about the contractor's capacity to handle these matters. Because of all of these reasons, and in coordination with the EU delegation of this country, we have come to the conclusion that this is not the project for the EIB to finance. So these high standards that we are setting for ourselves on environmental and social matters mean that sometimes we find ourselves not wanting to finance specific projects that maybe others will come and finance. Maybe that they, they will have to apply their rules, but we are going to be applying the highest standards on each one of these aspects. And not only on environment and social, on tough topics like non-compliant jurisdictions. The European Union is taking a particular stance on these topics and the EU bank is following this. On EU department and EU sanctions, and then, you know, this leads to situations like Belarus. And I know Belarus is not in Africa, but it is very, it is very recent. And here, in line with the European Council and uh, the, the, the other European authorities, the EIB has condemned the actions of the Belarus government with regard to the, to the commercial flight that, that was diverted. And we have already stopped since the presidential elections in Belarus, so some time ago, we stopped all our activity in Belarus. And we will continue to maintain this stance in line with the EU policy. This is not something that you're seeing every other multilateral development bank doing, but the EIB is doing it. We're following EU and the actions that the EU is, is applying. And let me give another example of Africa, and it is in Mali. So in Mali recently, we, we all know what has, what has happened. And our first reaction was to call the EU delegation and say, what should we do? What the EIB has quite a number of projects in Mali. We have originated new ones that we're looking into. How should we react towards this? Because what is important is that there is a unified European action. It would make no sense that the European Commission is going and taking one stance and that the EIB is taking a different one. So this coordinated approach is part of being the EU bank. Also being part of being the EU bank means that we are the climate bank because climate is a priority for the European Union. It is a top driver of the policies inside the EU and climate is global. So it is therefore also a top driver in the activity outside the Union. And we know about the Green Deal for Africa, for example. So here, already at the end of 2019, the EIB board decided to increase the level of climate and environment commitment of the EIB group. This applies inside and outside the European Union. And this increased ambition has far-reaching implications and is changing this house, what we do and how we do it. And this has then been taken shape in what we call the Climate Roadmap, that is a document that we have published. What does this mean specifically? It means that since the 1st of January 2021, the EIB is acting in full alignment with the Paris Agreement. This means no fossil fuels. It means that each one, so each one of our projects is screened against climate risks. It is going to be about being future-proof with regard to climate change, but also making sure that we're not doing any harm. It also means that uh, the other commitment that we have taken is that by 2025, 50% of our financing will be dedicated to climate action and environmental sustainability. This is very high because it means that the other 50%, which is fully Paris aligned, is what we can use for other activities that are not directly dedicated to mitigation or adaptation to climate change. And here would come 
the digital efforts that we are financing, access to finance for small and medium-sized enterprises, human capital, health, all of these will be in the other 50%, because 50% of our activity is going to be directly dedicated to climate action and environmental sustainability. And the third commitment that we took is that by 2030, one trillion euro will have been financed for investments in climate action and environmental sustainability by the EIB. This is a huge amount. And this requires that we start already today. And the fourth element that I wanted to share with you about what it means to be the EU bank is that Team Europe comes natural to us. In a way, you know, we were Team Europe before the concept of Team Europe was created. For us, the blue flag with, with the yellow stars is our flag. And we feel motivated by giving visibility to what, whatever the EIB is doing as part of this Team Europe activity. But let me come to more specifics. What does Paris alignment mean for us in terms of operations? It's about choices that we have to be making. It means that everything we do, our activities, what we do with our buildings, what we do with regard to traveling, what we do with our treasury, and what we do with all our operations, has to be aligned with the objectives and principles of the Paris Agreement. And this means that we have to be in line with achieving the target of global warming remaining well below two degrees Celsius. And therefore, that we will only support investments that are consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. So there's a lot of adaptation to climate change within this. And adaptation is essential in Africa because Africans might not be the cause of climate change, but they're definitely the ones that are suffering it very, very much. And then in terms of examples, it means we will not be financing airport expansions. We will be financing in Africa, but in particular, security in airports, and particularly for landlocked countries, but not airport expansion. It also means that we will not be financing fossil fuels in any form. So no, no gas powered, and I know that gas is in particular because coal, everybody understands better, but gas powered power plants, we will not be financing, we will not be financing gas pipelines. It also means that we will be engaging with each one of the partner countries and discussing with them their national, nationally determined contributions and how we can help them to achieve these and their national adaptation plans. And these conversations we're having together with the EU delegations. So uh, this, this point on climate is, is really driving much of what we do and much of what we are planning to do going forward. Within this, it's a lot about making choices, what we will no longer finance and what we will be prioritizing for finance, but also what kinds of instruments we're going to be using. And here, I want to mention the example of green bonds. I suppose that Christian will come into, into this as well, because in particular on green bonds, what we want to do is support new issuers so that they issue quality green bonds. And for this, we will be willing to provide technical assistance. I count on, on, on Sandra for the budget for this technical assistance, but we would be happy to deploy it. And also the EIB can act as an anchor investor to give confidence to the capital markets. Because using the power of capital markets for green investments in Africa is going to be essential to make a, a difference at scale, which is what we want to do. And then it also means that we're working on a number of private sector initiatives. I, I like in particular Renew Africa, because in Renew Africa, it is the private sector that came to the financial uh, group, to the EIB and to the European Development Finance Institutions, and told us, look, we want to work with you. How can we partner? So it, it was really them uh, that, that they were shaking us and asking us to, to become more active. Out of these, ex uh, these uh, exchanges that we have had with them, we now have together with the European Commission in EFSD, so in the External Investment Plan of 2017, a product that is called European Guarantee for Renewable Energy. 
And this is an extremely valuable product. It's a combination of technical assistance and, and guarantee capacity. But let me come to, to the question of what NDG means for us. Uh, and Digi Global Europe, and uh, what what it means in terms of the changes that we are we're seeing. There is two, and again, Sandra has mentioned them. It's all about partnerships. It's all about working together, and it's all about policy first. And in policy first, it's the Commission that is in the center. There's no point of having several parts of the European Union thinking what should be the policy that we should be following. So. The European Commission will give us the guidance and we will work in partnership with others in terms of delivery. It is no longer a donor recipient, and uh, this has been mentioned already, it's no longer about donor recipient relationships. It's about uh, this concept of a mutual commitment of the two partners. It's about creating common expectations about a common future, and it has to be mutually beneficial. Partnerships then means that it has to be done at country level, and therefore the EU delegations need to be there giving us the direction, giving us the guidance of what the priorities have to be. It's also about partnerships amongst the multilateral development banks and with the European bilaterals, the European development finance institutions. And here, the big and the small, there is strength in the European Union that we need to be harnessing. And it's not only the very strong EDFIs, it is also with some of the smaller ones. It's about working together and relying on each other. And he, and, and DG is really making this much easier because of the open access approach. There will be many more actors that can have access to blending, but also to the guarantees of the European Commission. And the European Commission will be in the center setting the policy priorities for all of us. Let me finish with a, a final section on health and on vaccines that has also been mentioned, because vaccines, I think, is, is where this concept of policy and partnerships really comes together. And we, we have the, 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 the situation that there cannot be prosperity without health. So all the efforts that we have been making over all these years with uh, achieving uh, the, the millennium objectives before and, and now towards the sustainable development goals, time is ticking. There's much less, uh, many less years left for 2030 and the pandemic came. And it has really pushed countries in Africa back a lot. So we need to address the question of access to vaccines. Because without this, they cannot move on. They are, they are, they are going to be stuck. We are looking, as Sandra was saying, forward to, to a summer, maybe even without having to wear the masks, and, and they are not having access to this yet. And the solution is a multilateral solution. The solution is COVAX. It is a difficult way, but we have already achieved the existence of COVAX. And here, the European Union had the vision already back in September 2020. And we need to remember that in September 2020, there were no vaccines approved. The first ones were approved at the end of December. By then, the first Team Europe operation directly channeling funds into COVAX was in place. So there it was, the European Commission with the EIB using EFSD funds and EU member states as donors. The European Union was there when the others were not. It was easy for the US to come. Of course, there was also a change of government. But when they came in February and they were making pledges to COVAX, which were, of course, extremely welcome. Huh? But by then we knew there were three vaccines approved by WHO. At the time when we committed, when we signed, there were none. But that was the time when COVAX needed to have the funds, the cash on the table, so that they could be making reservations with the manufacturers. The manufacturers could be stepping up their manufacturing capacity and vaccines could be delivered. They started to be delivered at the end of February. Yes, there's not enough. Clearly there's not enough. And there's still many countries that have not received enough vaccines even to cover their most vulnerable population and their health workers. So much more needs to be done with COVAX, but what COVAX can achieve for African countries Honestly, nobody else can.
and and this is something that we need to recognize and therefore we need to keep supporting COVAX. The European Union has done it. In February, President von der Leyen announced the doubling of our contribution to COVAX. And last week, on, or on the 21st of, of uh, no, last week, last week at the, at the COVAX event, President von der Leyen also announced an additional operation using EIB's capacities, because, you know, we are the bank of the EU. And here we're going to be working, creating links between COVAX and AVAT because ownership is very important. And AVAT is the African own initiative. So how to create synergies between COVAX and AVAT to achieve that common goal, in this case now aiming at up to 60% of the population in Africa is essential. But it's not enough. COVAX is not enough. We need to be working on manufacturing capacity, localized manufacturing capacity. Again, there's a Team Europe initiative about this and the EIB has announced a, a platform of financiers that is called Shira. It's sustainable health industry for resilience in Africa. And this is about manufacturing, looking at the future. It's not going to be necessarily for this pandemic, but what this pandemic has created is the, the, the spotlight on the needs of more manufacturing in Africa, less dependence, less reliance on others. And the last area on, on health is that we also need to be supporting the, the governments. And here it is about sovereign loans. And thanks to the EU guarantee, the EIB is lending in Niger, in Benin, in Rwanda, in Angola, and will be lending in, in other countries. So I'll, I'll finish now. I know I've taken a lot, a lot of time, but I did want to mention how all of this work in the context of NDK Global Europe is being coordinated with INPA, it's guided by INPA, and it is working with the EU delegation so that we have that very country-driven and country ownership that, that we need. It's about working with the countries, it's about a true partnership, and it is about this spirit of NDG where we are all working within now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. Very comprehensive, very clear. Um, and I have, a, I have a few questions before I move to uh, Christian, just for clarification for me. You mentioned EIB is a climate bank, uh, of course, overall, and for the uh, its external action. Uh, do you have a data on what is your green asset ratio? What is our, sorry, our? Green asset ratio. So, uh, I, I, I'm not sure how we would define green asset ratio. What I can tell you is that we apply the EU taxonomy. So in that sense, in terms of EU tax, taxonomy, which is not only about green, mm -hmm. um, uh, we are at a very high level. Uh, uh, last year, I think we were mm -hmm. at 39%. So aiming at this 50 we are already at 39% in the activity outside the union. So we are not in a, we are not in a bad place. In fact, because the needs are huge. So what, what this climate action approach is giving us is a focus. There's many things you can do in Africa, but when you know that there are some specific ones that are the ones you want to, to do, and when you put technical assistance, capacity building, you help in the creation of the projects, then those are the ones you can be financing, and that's the conversations that we're having with the countries. And let me you know, state again, adaptation is essential. It's about biodiversity and adaptation. It's not only about renewable energy, which is fantastic, but it is not only that. So we are at a high percentage and, 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 and going higher. That's very good. Uh, a second question linked to this. So normally when you work in the countries, you work with uh, directly with the local banks or directly to the private sector. It means uh, the borrowers so do you how do you work and how do you how are you sure that those banks for example local banks are also applying uh, you know the climate uh, targets and you know how, how do you deal with that in fact yeah. no, it's your in, to put the question broader how do you screen uh, your actors when you work in the countries yeah so we work in both ways when the project is big enough when we're talking about uh, more than 10 million euro, we would lend directly. And therefore there we would do the whole 
due diligence ourselves, or we are working with a co-financier and we are sharing the tasks. But in, in those operations, we would be working directly with the, the private sector, be it European investors in Africa or African born, African, you know, grown uh, private sector companies. Uh, when we're working with smaller amounts and there is a lot of need for microfinance and for small loans for SMEs, that we would do with local banks because they have they have that, that capillarity capacity. And there what we do is in our analysis, we look at what are their environmental and social standards. And the second thing we do is we tend to always accompany our loans with technical assistance for the intermediary, sometimes also for the beneficiaries, but technical assistance for the for the intermediary, so that we can help them reinforce their capacities on on climate analysis, climate risk analysis as well, but also, for example, on gender. You know, we help them to develop gender strategies so that they become actors and you know activists in this access to finance for women entrepreneurs as well. So it's it's a combination of technical assistance and the um, and, and 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 the you know the knowledge that we have of these banks and our analysis of them. Yes, uh, thank you. Also mentioned uh, Covax and uh, uh, the synergies between Covax and Avat. I think this is very very uh, key uh, recommendation, and I think should should happen. But uh, based on our research, we've, we've seen that there is a serious logistical problem in Africa for the distribution, uh, and this is uh, linked to the, inf the weak infrastructure in uh, in uh, in Africa, particularly how to channel uh, the uh, the vaccines to rural areas, to the vulnerable population, and 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 also the difficulties of those uh, vaccines in normal conditions. You know, we know that some of the vaccines they need. Uh, very, uh, I would say, uh, specific uh, conditions in terms of the, uh, um, the you know, the, the overall heat and you know all of it. So, so how 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 do you see this? Is isn't it a, a problem of infrastructure financing rather than really just channeling only the vaccines at the same time, which makes it more difficult, in fact, to uh, wanting to achieve the the objective. The, I, I think there are two different topics. They are very much related and one does not exclude the other. So first, we need to bring vaccines to them. That's one thing. And that that is what is the, the task of COVAX. So to, to procure, they use UNICEF, in fact, for procurement and to bring them to the main port or main airport of the country. That is one task. It's also important to note that uh, COVAX is, uh, co is coordinated with CEPI, with WHO, and with Gavi. And there, there is a very important role for WHO. So WHO is the one that is looking at the country preparedness. And in fact, and you know, I, I, I know quite a lot because I am very involved with COVAX. I am in, 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 very, in many of their committees. There has been a lot of controversy about the allocation policy. And some countries were saying, why are you not allocating vaccines to us? And what COVAX was telling them is, because you're not prepared. We cannot send you the vaccines because you're not prepared yet. So this is the technical assistance and they have put in place, there's a budget for technical assistance to help countries be prepared to use and, and deploy the vaccines. There is also there quite a lot of finance from the World Bank, from the EIB and from others to achieve this. And then there are countries that are, they, they have to make the choices. And again, here is a question of, of ownership. Eh? they need to make the choices of which vaccines they are ordering. It is clear that not all of them are equipped to order Pfizer or you know, Moderna type of vaccines that need this deep freeze um, capacity in the countries. And they are aware of it. You know, it's really sad. I've been uh, discussing with the Minister of Health of Uganda and he was saying, I need to wait for the AstraZeneca ones or I'm hoping for the Johnson & Johnson ones because I know I cannot use the other ones. So he was feeling that how the constraints of the country were putting the, the population in the country at a disadvantage, but it is a, it is a reality and that right now cannot be solved quickly or quickly enough. What we need to make sure is that we are better prepared next time. And for that, we are working with the European Commission and working with some other parts of, of Intpan. We are going to make announcements in a few weeks with WHO 
and the European Commission. So you will hear more about that. I cannot, I cannot tell you more now, but there is really a need for pandemic preparedness and strengthening of primary healthcare capacities in these countries. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to move straight to uh, Christian. Christian, uh, I think you're the representing the private sector. So, and I, I know that a lot of pressure on the private sector to uh, to to contribute in this uh, in in this challenging uh, socioeconomic conditions, specifically for all the low and middle income countries. So, how do you see this? What have you done? How do you see the recovery? Please. Yeah. Thank you, then. Um, so I would like to start by uh, asking you a question, Maria and, 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 and Rim. So, you know, uh, I work in investment management, you know, so we manage uh, investment funds. Uh, we also mentioned pension funds for people who want to retire. So Rim, you're a professor, you have a very good salary. Maria, you earn a very good salary in the public sector in Luxembourg, you know. I hear that taxes are also very low in Luxembourg. So you're making good money, you know, you must be in a happy situation. But uh, we will all retire at one point in time. And then when we retire, we will have less money. No? So um, you have very good income today. Maybe you want to save some money with uh, us, for example. I mean, we can, we can manage money for you. And we can invest it on your behalf. And uh, you know, you can put it in an investment fund. Uh, Sandra was very concerned that this was only for the rich. That's not true. You can invest up to 25 euros per month. Yeah? So if you have 25 euros per month, you can open an account and we will invest for you. So uh, I have two options for you. Uh, either uh, you can invest in Africa, but when you invest in Africa today, you're investing, of course, you're investing in a, in a continent with a great future. I mean, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, had its economies have contracted by 2.6% in uh, 2020. The contraction has been led by Zimbabwe, which is down 10%, South Africa, minus 7.1%, but also Gambia, all the other countries, except for Cote d'Ivoire, had a negative growth rates in, in 2020. But, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa has had great growth rates over the last decade, and they will grow again. I and mean, they will grow 3.5% uh, most likely this year, uh, led by, um, you know, many countries. I mean, we're going to have Uganda growing more than 5% this year. Uh, even Zambia, uh, because of the rise in copper prices, will grow by more than 3%. So you can invest in Africa. It's a continent that is growing very nicely. It's a very vibrant private sector. But unfortunately, you would be investing at a point in time when the official sector is telling all of us that um, they want debt relief. So when you put the, your money with us, your money, no, you give it to me to invest it on your behalf. Tomorrow, uh, you may have to um, forego maybe half of what you invested, Maria. It may be gone. And by the way, um, the official sector is telling us that there will be uh, debt relief without consultation with the private sector. That uh, the the sustainability assessment will be done under the common framework and uh, the DSSI without any consultation with the private sector. They will just impose it. And by the way, contrary to what we heard from Sandra, the official sector is not offering any debt relief. The only thing they're offering is debt service suspension. So they, they will suspend interest payments for one or two years, and then uh, they want every single cent back with interest. Yeah. So there's zero debt relief, contrary to what Sandra has said. So you can put your money in a little fund. We have a fund here. That invest in Africa, but half of that money may be gone tomorrow uh, because um, there will be def debt relief. Um, the other alternative is you could, and, and the other problem when you invest in Africa is we really don't know what the money will be spent on. So, you know, governance in Africa is very difficult. There's a lot of corruption. Uh, you know, the environmental and the social standards are not what we are used to here in Luxembourg uh, as a co or, or in the UK. Now, that's one possibility. Money may be gone, but you would be investing in Africa. And we, we know from the official sector that they want us uh, to invest in Africa. And the other alternative for your retirement would be to invest uh, in some good European companies, such as Kering or Louis Vuitton. Uh, you know, they have great ESG standards. They produce uh, luxury goods. Uh, they do it with, you know, well-paid labor. Uh, they look at gender representation on the boards. Uh, and they sell uh, scarves and uh, handbags and nice things to Chinese and to wealthy Africans. And they have an enormous amount of uh, profitability. And if you go to Paris, you can see all the beautiful museums and they're funding there with um, you know, artwork uh, that is uh, actually melting away uh, in the sunshine. So um, what would you do with your money, Rem? It's up to you, you can choose. 
You want me to? It, it, I, I don't think I will do either thing. So uh, ah, you would do it. Okay. No, I don't. So what I will do, I will invest myself uh, uh, based on my own thinking. That's all. So you wouldn't invest in Africa. I would. Okay. How about you, Maria? Would you invest in Africa under these circumstances? You know what I would do? I would invest in a fund that invests in private sector in Africa, mm -hmm. in well-identified projects where I would expect that my fund manager has checked the environmental and social standards and that they give me assurances about that. Very and good I idea, would be Maria, investing but... in the private sector <clears throat> in Africa. Very good uh, idea, Maria. But let me tell you, just as a word of warning, yeah, if you invest in a country and you can see that in Spain, uh, you can see that in Greece and in many other countries, if you destroy the government, yeah, and if the government goes bankrupt, all forms of private sector financial intimidation suffer. Yeah, um, and uh, you, you you could see in Spain what happened when the Spanish government was under pressure during the eurozone financial crisis. I mean, the the economy fell into a recession. You no, know? so you cannot invest in the private sector without a functioning government. Yeah? But that's just a word of warning. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure I agree. Eh? I'm not sure I agree. I understand that the rating would suffer, but not the underlying solvency of those, you know, the underlying value of those investments. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in most countries, I mean, I would say in almost all countries of the world, you have a government yield curve, no? Uh, and then you have a corporate yield curve. And the corporate sector tends to pay more than the government. In any country, in, in the UK, in Spain, anywhere, uh, if you have a choice of investing in the private sector and the government sector, the government always has lower yields. If you force the government into default, like in Argentina, no, the private sector will go into default as well. Yeah. So what I'm saying here is that uh, we hear a lot of lip service from the official sector uh, that uh, private sector investment in Africa is required. But at the same time, hindrances are being put in the way of the private sector. And I would say hindrances are put, being put in the way, especially of the regulated European private sector. Because if we do not invest in Africa, China will. And the questions that we're asking, the ESG questions that we're asking, China is not asking. Yeah. So I'm really wondering whether the approach that has been taken here post COVID is the right approach to help Africa. And, you know, I don't want to go down the way of uh, Dambisa Moyo, yeah, uh, and argue that, um, aid, such as the aid provided by the EIB and the European Commission is not working and uh, is, um, is a dead aid for Africa. That would be an exaggeration. But I would say that the tremendous growth that we've seen in Africa, the tremendous improvement of living conditions that we've seen in Africa over the last 15 years yeah, is not due to aid. Yeah? It is due to a vibrant private sector. Yeah? Uh, Africa you know, has had lost decades ever since the end of European colonialism, yeah, while it was dependent on official development assistance for decades. There was lost, lost decades that were sort of a feast, yeah, for uh, small elites, yeah, and, uh, and misery for the population. And that has only changed once the, the vibrant private sector started to evolve in Africa. Yeah? So I, I personally am a, I'm a fan of private sector financial intermediation. So anyway, looking at sort of the future, uh, we're in a situation here where um, uh, the situation in Africa has been extremely difficult. Yeah? Um, I mean, just on, on a human level, uh, if you look at Kenya, more than 40% of children have not been going to school for a year. Um, a lot of people who are dependent um, on services uh, to, to fund their livelihood uh, have not had incomes. Uh, they've been suffering from infection. Uh, we've seen that um, you know social conditions have deteriorated a lot in those countries. Uh, we see that uh, the official sector has provided some help. Uh, there's been emergency dispersions from the IMF's RFI and RFC um, to Namibia, to South Sudan, and to many to 34 countries uh, in Africa that have uh, have been receiving some emergency funding. But the the question really is, how do we get Africa to work again? You know? And, and frankly, uh, the question for me as, as somebody uh, from the financial services uh, is how do we get in our world money to flow where it is needed? Yeah. We have scarcity of capital in Africa. 
and uh, we have an, a vibrant uh, private sector, and because of that, yields are high. And at the same time, in Luxembourg, yields are negative. Yeah? In the UK, yields are zero. So we have an abundance and too much capital, negative real interest rates in advanced economy, and we have scarcity of capital in Africa. And we need to find a way to channel money where it is most productive, yeah? and that happens to be in emerging economies. Yeah? So um, I think there, there are two ways of going about this. I and mean, one way would be to continue as we are today, and a consequence of that will be a withdrawal of the private sector, uh, a further withdrawal of uh, private sector cross-border financial intermediation with Africa, and we will leave it to the EIB yeah, and to official development assistance, as in the past, yeah, and to the Chinese. Yeah, that's one, one road. And uh, I have great faith in what the EIB does. And I also think that uh, Sandra is doing a, a tremendous job at the European Commission. So there are a lot of good projects will be funded with the help of the EIB and uh, with, the, with the help of the European Commission. But if we do not want to go down the road of state capitalism, um, yeah, where um, you know the state banks uh, are really running the show, um, it will mean that there will be less money available for Africa. And and by the way, even if Europe does not provide the money, the Chinese will. Yeah. And and the other way uh, would be a way which facilitates private sector financial intermediation with Africa. Yeah. Now that is a way. Uh, that will not happen without debt relief for countries that are over indebted. Uh, Zambia, for example, uh, needs debt relief. Um, Ethiopia, I'm less sure. Yeah, but some other countries in Africa will certainly need. Uh, you know, Congo Brazzaville will need debt relief. No, so some countries in Africa will will certainly need debt relief. Now, uh, the question for me is, how can you sort of restart? private sector financial intimidation with Africa. And you know, if I look at um, the funding costs of emerging markets today, we can see a clear, clear divergence. We can see uh, normal countries, yeah, uh, such as, um, you know, whatever, I mean, some of these, uh, Peru, for example, yeah, or um, uh, um, normal emerging market countries. And then we see countries that are eligible to, for DSSI, uh, debt service suspension initiative and countries that are eligible for um, the common framework. And if you look at the at the risk premia of those countries, we see a clear divergence. Any country that is eligible for DSSI that has been named by the World Bank and the IMF as being DSSI eligible has seen a jump in its borrowing costs. Yeah. So all the initiative has done so far is hinder access to funding for those countries that need it most. Yeah. I think it's quite unfortunate. Anyway, so I think what, what can be done um, to, to move forward here and to, to re-engage the public sector and to convince people like RIM to invest in Africa who would not do that either, no, Maria. So I have one or two proposals here. Um, one of them would be to say, let's say we have a country that needs debt relief. Yeah. And let, let's let's assume that the two of you because of imprudence or um, you know courage, yeah, have put your money. I, let me ask you that question, Maria. Let's assume that you put your money into an investment fund that invests in Africa, you know, and uh, you you task uh, the fund manager. It's your retirement savings, you no? Know? So you want to you have some money in your retirement, you no? Know? So you task the fund manager with the fiduciary responsibility to manage that money on your behalf, you no? Know? And now that fund manager has been approached by some people in the official sector, who turn to him and say. Christian, we want you to grant voluntary debt relief to uh, an African country, yeah, which means foregoing 45 to 50% of your of your investments on a voluntary basis. Yeah, you're not forced. Yeah. Maria, would you want me to do this on your behalf? Or would you sue me for having violated my fiduciary responsibilities? You know what I would ask you? How much of that debt of that country is commercial debt already? Because somehow in the past, you know, it looks as if now there is a problem to solve. There is a problem to solve. But part of the creation of that problem has been the issuances of these countries in the international markets. Very good. And not, so only, not only then, still this week. I mean, this week, Senegal was issuing bonds. And, and everybody was coming and running to buy these bonds in Senegal. And the expectation is that there's many other African countries that are behind. 
So I understand what you say. I, I really, I really do, eh? and I, I understand the argument that you're that you're making. But the private sector was happy to take those high yields in the past, and then comes and says, and now they are over indebted, and now you're asking me for 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 the cuts, the haircuts, which is the same that has happened in many other countries, also mm. in the European Union. But sorry, I let you continue. Yeah. No, I mean, I personally think that, you know, whenever a country is over indebted, the private sector should offer a haircut. Yeah. Uh, and it should not ask to be bailed out. It is uh, unacceptable uh, to ask to be bailed out by the official sector. Yeah. Uh, and no, uh, no official sector money should be used to bail out uh, the private sector. If there is an over indebtedness, there needs to be a haircut. Yeah. Uh, that is not only my position, that's the position of most people in the private sector. And uh, you've seen Argentina, you know, Greece. Um, Ecuador, I mean, all of those countries got big debt relief, no, a relatively fast debt relief. Yeah. And in the case of Zambia, there will also be debt relief. In the case of Mozambique, there's been debt relief, no. So whenever there is too much debt, yeah, uh, I think that uh, there should be debt relief. Yeah. I have two reservations. The first one is, I'm as I have a res fiduciary responsibility for those people who, out of courage or imprudence, have invested in Africa. Yeah. And I have to look after their best interests, no. And I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, voluntarily give debt relief without uh, any consultation, yeah, and without having, uh, without having a look at the debt sustainability analysis. Yeah, I cannot. Uh, it would be violating my, my responsibilities. And the second point I would like to say is, the approach that the official sector is taking here is um, a little bit uh, schizophrenic, if you wish, no. Because they're asking at the same at the same time they're asking the private sector to provide generous debt relief, and then they're asking the same the same private sector to invest in those countries. Yeah. So they, they say like, okay, I'm going to kick you, but the next day I want you to come right back. Yeah. Why should I come back? No. So you know, I, I think it has to be a little bit more sensible here. It should it should be a bit more cooperation, a bit more discussion, involvement. Yeah. And then I think sensible people can come to to a conclusion. So let me make we don't have a lot of time. Let me make a proposal here. Um, we have two problems in Africa. The first problem is that some countries are, are over indebted, yeah, and they need debt relief. And it's not it's not straightforward to do debt relief when you have thousands and thousands of bondholders, uh, you know, working for different financial institutions. Yeah, but some countries do need debt relief. No, and the second problem we have is we have very little control over the use of proceeds you know, in those countries. Look at Mozambique, yeah, uh, the Imatum transaction. Uh, 1.5 billion that was lent to Mozambique to buy tuna boats. 40 million has been used to buy tuna boats. The rest of the money was squandered and stolen. Yeah, uh, and uh, it was hidden from the from the public eye. Once the whole thing emerged, uh, the country went into default and into massive financial crisis. So very little, very very little transparency in the use of currency. Yeah. So my proposal is the following: Let's say you have a country that needs um, debt relief. Yeah. Um, what we could do is we could offer a voluntary exchange of uh, the, the the bonds of this country into new bonds, but not into normal new bonds, into SDG bonds. Yeah? Bonds which have a very clear um, commitment for the use of proceeds uh, in order to meet the 17 sustainable development goals that have been defined by the United Nations. Yeah? And a clear monitoring of the use of proceeds by an international agency, either the EIB or the European Commission or some organization that is tasked by it. You know? So we, we do a voluntary swap yeah, um, of existing bonds of an over-indebted African country into new bonds, which are SDG-linked bonds, where the, where the issuer commits yeah, to spend the money on tasks that actually help it attain sustainable development goals. And the new bonds, by the way, have a haircut of, let's say, 30%. So we forego 30% of our claim on the country on a voluntary basis. And in return, we get an SDG bond. Yeah. And um, so how do we do this on a voluntary basis? Um, we, we do it with a partial guarantee of that new bond by some entity. Yeah. It could be whatever entity. I mean, World Bank, you name it. You know? Like in the Ghana 2030 bond. The Ghana 2030 bond has a partial guarantee from the World Bank. I think that would be a win-win solution. You know? Because Africa would get the debt relief that it needs. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, we would make sure that the money going forward will be used uh, for sensible goals, yeah, and there will be 
the monitoring on the use of proceeds. And the official sector would be able to jumpstart uh, the market for SDG bonds in Africa, uh, which otherwise would be difficult uh, to develop. Yeah. That would be my, my sort of concrete proposal. Thank you. Uh, I could I could I just sorry yes. could I add two more elements to this? Yes, please. So uh, just to say that with a commitment on debt discipline, because you know what you don't want is to do this and then find yourself again in three four years time in the same situation because not you but somebody else has been uh, crazily lending to this country. So debt discipline, and this then requires debt transparency. Absolutely. So, those two elements, discipline and transparency, and transparency that includes everyone from all around the globe. Including that the is what, what would be, so I just thought, you know, I wanted to complement with those two points. And maybe I can add one more point here. Uh, to be frank, I, I am a big fan of investing in Africa, uh, you know, because I think it's a continent that has a great future, yeah. And compared to Europe, at least it has some growth, yeah. Uh, but I think the form, um, that lending to Africa has taken over the last 20, 30 years is probably the worst form of um, cross-border financial intimidation that you can think of, you know, because you lend at fixed rates in a foreign currency, yeah, to those countries, you know, and you build massive currency mismatches on the balance sheet of that of that country. Whether it's EIB lending, which happens to be in euros, yeah, uh, or, um, you know, or private sector lending, which is in dollars or in euros, it's the same thing. You build currency mismatches and you reduce the financial resilience of those countries. So ideally, when you restructure that, you want to move away from this form of financial intimidation. You want to move to a form of financial intimidation which aligns the capacity to pay and the payment obligations. Now, the capacity to pay of private entities and of um, public entities alike happens to be in local currency, yeah, because their income stream uh, is either taxes in local currencies or sales proceeds for a company, which also happen to be denominated in local currency, unless you look at a carbon export, a carbon carbon extracting industry, no, um, you know, like whatever, uh, Angu uh, Angula oil or whatever, yeah. But if it's a normal company that doesn't do too much to harm our environment and our planet by engaging in extract of oil and uh, carbon hydrates, no, it will have revenues in domestic currency, no. So lending to a country or to a private entity which has revenues in domestic currency in dollars or in euros is not sane, no? Because you build a currency mismatch which is at the root of most financial crises, as we know from the works of Guillermo Calvo. So, you know, sudden stuff. So ideally, when we get out of this crisis, we will have helped develop the domestic bond market and the domestic currency uh, market in Africa. So I think it would be great if there would be more um, you know, not only more transparent lending, but also more domestic currency lending to Africa. So, uh, okay, let's assume uh, your proposal goes forward, uh, Christian. Um, so I, I would like to ask uh, Maria and uh, Sandra, would you be interested to put this partial guarantee, for example, on a country that is willing to have the swap uh, of their old debt into this SDG type of debt. Maybe Sandra, I start with Sandra. Do you hear me? Because I was switched off. Can you hear me? We do. Yes. Okay, I'm very sorry I was uh, kicked out and I came just came back in. I must have missed uh, quite a bit. Um, I missed... Uh, uh, most, I think, of what Mr. Kopp said. Um, of course, uh, Mr. Kopp knows that the European Commission is not a lender. So if I speak about debt relief, I speak about debt relief, which is given by countries that lend, such as Germany. So, uh, But there is, of course, uh, the special drawing rights, uh, of which uh, 33 billion will go to African countries. That's one thing. And of course, the support to the debt service suspension initiative as well as the common framework of debt treatment beyond that and the catastrophe containment relief trust and there we do come in because uh, we contributed 183 million which helps 23 countries in sub-saharan africa so just to say that that is all um you know uh things that that we do 
Um, I have then left the meeting because I could not hear anything. So I'm afraid, Rim, that I cannot, I do not, have not captured what Mr. Kopf um, proposed. But I'm very sure that Maria has and that she has an answer to it. Yeah, you, you partially answered. So it's, uh, it, it, it's, oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't even dare to put on my camera in, in case I lose you again. No, don't worry. So, Maria, so would you would you put the part together? Sandra, Sandra and I should really do a, like a double act, eh? you know, because we really we really <laughs> complement each other. <laughs> you know, I, I I um we've tried, Christian, we've tried. So I can tell you, SDG themed bonds. It is a product that the EIB offers. We have been providing technical assistance to a number of issuers for them to issue SDG themed bonds. So not only green bonds, green bonds are in a way, you know, they are now much more general market. No, you know, 12 years ago, it was the beginning of this market. Now there is a, a, a good system for, for green bonds. You probably know the EIB has started issuing SDG themed bonds and we are, but that's fine. I mean, we can do it. We have the equipment to do this. We have the capacity to measure. But what is important is that others are also issuing SDG themed bonds in Africa. So we have been working are. with a number of players in Africa. We, we provided technical assistance. For the moment, they have not issued. And you know why? Because they do not get a pricing differentiation. Well, that's so not true. what they, they see, it's, it's, what they, it's, it's what they, you know, what we're seeing. And the second element, and you mentioned the, the partial guarantee, that we have also tried. And in fact, you know, when I spoke about green bonds, I said that MTBs like the EIB, we could be anchor investors because that seems to be a more valued type of contribution that we can make to create confidence. Because when you provide a partial guarantee, you do not get a rating uplift. You get an improvement in the loss given default, but you're not changing the probability of default. And therefore, from a rating point of view, there's no improvement. And what we saw is that from a pricing point of view, there was no improvement. And we need to be additional. We want to make sure that there is a, a change thanks to our intervention. And if that's not going to be there, we would not do it. And that's why we're looking at anchor investor rather than the, the, the partial guarantee. I see that in your case, what you were talking about is sovereigns. So providing a partial guarantee on sovereigns. And my, I have a bit of a problem with this because sovereigns are sovereign. They can do whatever they want. They can decide not to pay. They can decide, you know, you were also mentioning currency mismatches, but lending to a sovereign in their own currency, you are really putting yourself in, in, in their hands if they want to devaluate the currency. So the EIB, thanks to funds from EU member states, we do lending in, current, in local currency, in like 15 uh, sub Saharan African local currencies. But we lend local currency only to the private sector. So we would lend in local currency to banks for them to own lend or for private uh, companies in the telecom sector, for example, whose revenues are going to be in the local currency so that they can repay to us in local currency synthetically. And like that, they don't have the, this, this um, currency mismatch. So there it makes sense to me. With sovereigns, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced yet. But the idea of SDG theme bonds is the way forward. Because there has to be, you know, in the same way that I said debt discipline, there should be use of proceeds discipline. And that's where this could come in. I, I think this is a key uh, use of proceeds. I know that Ghana is now uh, looking to have an SDG uh, bond, sustainable bond as well. The problem is how do they use those uh, proceeds and who is monitoring uh, this? Yeah, yeah. But precisely for that, EU taxonomy, that is the answer. And the EU taxonomy is not for the inside the union. It's a global service in a way. You know, the European Union is developing this taxonomy as a as a service, as a as a standard that can be used globally. Because yes. there is where you would have the, the real good. Of course, then the second thing is you need a third party verifier. Absolutely. an independent verifier exactly that's uh, that's a very key uh, point specifically yeah. on uh, on those uh, on but there's more and more of those eh? of of you know of rating agencies that are not of of um of credit risk that are of use of proceeds mm -hmm. 
there's there's more and more and and the more offer there is the more there will be of these entities that are willing to do those those but tasks let me look at the chat because um since there are two chats on the left on on my uh, hand uh, my right side so I'm, I'm looking at the right side uh, one of the participants is saying that uh, the eu member states could play a coordinated role in making the best use of the new SDRs 650 billion allocation toward low income African countries. So this is something that could be eventually uh, explored. I see also on the left hand side of my screen. Um, okay, uh, Karel is asking Christian, I don't know if Christian is still there. What happened if the ESG bond does not work? Uh, so when again, the money disappears? Okay, yes, I mean, it, that's a good point. So like the case of Mozambique, it's possible. Uh, I don't know if Christian can answer this. I don't see him on screen anymore. Um, and then, uh, of course, there are issues related to governance uh, in Africa, which probably more technical assistance, more education, more engagement uh, is important also on the eu side i mean uh, you know from sandra you know on the partnership side i think more investment in in technical assistant edu uh, assistance state education on the governance side institutional side transparency side i think this is key and on, uh, not only on the use of the debt not only the sovereign re uh, sovereign re debt but also on the private debt i mean so trying really to explain what is the best or what is the optimal debt structure in a company or overall i think this is important um now there is one question uh, uh which I, I it's the first question we had at this panel whether the eu has the power to regulate arms sales to the mediterranean and africa mm. i don't know who can answer to this Well, I, uh, yeah, Rima, I can maybe help you out with a couple of things. And I just, if, if I may, huh, I hope, hope you can hear me because I'm seeing in the chat as well. And, uh, and that's what we started out saying. We know that. Um, and your second question, can uh, Africa uh, be able to produce and can we help with it? Yes, of course. And we just had the Global Health Summit in Rome where President von der Leyen made the commitment uh, a 1 billion euro commitment uh, to uh, vaccine production, vaccine manufacturing in Africa. And there's a couple of hubs that is we're looking into, because as you can imagine, there's a lot of uh, issues, regulatory issues, or skills and people that need to be trained and educated South Africa, Rwanda are all places where we're uh, looking at. And I think that Maria addressed this as well. So I just wanted to take that to, um, to Rui. Um, on the question of Flavio, how can we make best use? I mean, the 650 billion is worldwide. Huh? Africa is 33 billion of the special drawing rights. But yes, of course, uh, again, by putting policy first and by making sure that these investments are going into uh, green, sustainable uh, uh, investments. And I am completely in agreement with Maria that that should exclude anything that is based on fossil fuels. And uh, we fully are aligned in that with the EIB. And that is what the EU member states have actually committed themselves to. So that, that is already a commitment. From the twenty maybe Sandra, states, Sandra, to maybe need to switch off the green, camera. Just and a digital hmm. uh, global recovery. Okay, so that's uh, for Flavio and for Rui. Thank you, thank you, Sandra. So, uh, Maria, would you like to add any last comments based on the chat on the both sides of the screen? You unmute, Maria. Okay, sorry. No, I'm yeah. gone again. I, think. I, you know, between between the technical problems and the inaptitude. Sorry, I I wanted to come back on this SDRs point because I, I find that it is a major opportunity. This uh, this new uh, special drawing rights of the IMF that are expected to be issued. And yes, it's true that for for Africa is 33 billion. 
for sub-Saharan Africa, it's only 24 of these billions. So it is for them, what is allocated to them is, is not much. It's, it's a lot of money, but it's not much. What is important is, and this is, you know, one of those days that it, you, you feel particularly proud to be European, is that there is several European Union member states that have said there needs to be a reallocation of SDRs. So there is the SDRs that will be allocated for each country, depending on their participation in IMF. But then beyond this, those that need it less should be reallocating to those that need it more. Mm -hmm. And here I'm talking about not only low-income countries, but also middle-income countries in some of the cases. And that then, again, with a purpose. So it has to be for vaccines, or it has to be for sustainable development goals, for climate action. So it has to be a purpose-driven um, type of reallocation. But such a reallocation could go a long way to try to address the, the, the big consequences of the economic crisis out of the pandemic in these countries. So Thank that's you. the one I thought was their big opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Now, uh, Christian, last uh, word for this panel today. Yeah. So first I wanted to say to Maria, these SDG bonds are already being issued. Uh, one that I might like most is uh, the Bank uh, West African Development. Uh, they've issued an SDG bond under their new sustainable bond framework, which uh, invests, uh, amongst other things, in women empowerment in Mali uh, and, uh, and SMEs and so forth. Uh, all, there are very strict use of proceeds monitoring in this bond. It was issued at um, mid swaps plus 300, and uh, we were one of the anchor investors. No? So it's, uh, there is already uh, this kind of investment. And frankly, I think it's a good thing. I think these bonds are good. I mean, and Senegal, you know, to be clear, we bought Senegal, yeah. And, you know, I think there is a, it makes, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that the EIB is investing in Senegal, yeah. Uh, I think it's good that the EIB does it. I'm also happy to hear that Sandra is providing uh, aid to Senegal, you know. I also think that there is a place for the private sector in Senegal. I don't know if you would agree with that, Maria, but uh, I think that uh, it makes sense also to have, you know, what, what makes us, I mean, one of the things that distinguishes us as Europeans from the Chinese, for example, is that our prosperity is built on the private sector. You know? uh, and uh, I think that uh, we have uh, a move towards state capitalism and authoritarian governments everywhere in the world. Yeah? And Europe is different in that respect. And I think that uh, that is also something that in the interaction with Africa, we should continue to, to cherish. Uh, and then maybe one last thought on this ESG issue. So um, the European Union has put into place the uh, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, uh, which from uh, 2022 onwards will require all financial advisors across the European Union to inquire about the sustainability preference of their clients uh, when, uh, when um, you know, advising them on financial investments. You know? And we've done some tests on that, and it turns out that 60-70% of our clients, of our retail clients, will want to invest in sustainable products only. Um, even if it uh, means less um, yield, less return. Uh, and also all of, I mean, 80% of our institutional investors want to do sustainable investments, no? My big fear, yeah, is that as Europe moves towards an integration of ESG factors uh, in, in investment management, Africa is left out. Uh, my big fear is that this will actually lead to a withdrawal um, of um, financial innovation from Africa because it does not meet uh, the string, stringent, um, you know, uh, taxonomy um, criteria. And I'm not saying that we should be investing in coal power plants in Africa, no. Uh, but I think that there, there is a very clear correlation between per capita income and, uh, and ESG factors. If you do any ESG scoring, you will find that 80% of the cross-country variation can be explained uh, by a per capita income, no. And if you if you just assign ESG scores to all private and public entities, we will all end up investing in Norway and Switzerland, and withholding capital from Africa, and that would be a big shame. Yeah, and I think there are a number of African countries such as Senegal or Ghana, uh, which, given their level of economic development, have gone at great length uh, to take into account you know environmental, social, and government aspects. Other countries such as Nigeria, um, which are relatively um, prosperous for by African standards are way behind there. 
And I think we have to take a very differentiated approach in applying ESG factors to investments in Africa. Thank you very much, all. I think this was a very uh, interesting discussion. On, uh, I, I think it's our it's a first discussion because I agree that we've been talking to each other in a certain manner. So next time, probably we need to have uh, actors from uh, from the continent, from African Union side. Uh, and I, I think for me, what I, I would say I would conclude uh, from this discussion is first of all, and as uh, Sandra said, it's policy first, uh, not putting money first, policy first, uh, also enhancing the institutions. I hear, I see that one of uh, the comments, it's okay, uh, Europe, Africa, it's as a continent, it's richer than Europe and they still need others to, to you know, support them in moving into their recovery path. I think this is a matter of institution governance and this is also was mentioned at the beginning by uh, Carol in his, uh, in his, uh, in the chat, so governance, uh, you know, enhancing the capacities of institutions, uh, also trying to engage as much as as, as possible uh, uh, the leadership in this uh, in this uh, region, and uh, obviously see that there is still, fortunately, corruption. And I, I, uh, I share uh, the view also of uh, Christian. He mentioned this, and we've seen many cases in Africa where the money disappears uh, without any. I mean, follow up. So I, I think these are all very important elements that we need to keep in mind. Also, um, coherence in the frameworks, in the policy frameworks from the EU uh, level. And I see all these new transition changes institutionally that is hap that are happening. It's moving to some more coherence. Probably it will take time to operationalize these new structures. And very importantly, coordination. Uh, coordination between the different institutions, and I see there are a lot of coordination between both uh, Maria and 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 Sandra today. So uh, very good news. So thank you all, and I would like to thank very much the panelists, uh, Maria, uh, Sandra. She left already. Christian, I'm sure we will talk again on this same uh, topic, and hopefully I I see you again all in uh, in uh, in good health. Uh, and have a great weekend and also I'd like to thank uh, SEP's colleagues, uh, all the uh, participants who have been following us and then everybody who has uh, followed us and maybe will uh, watch this uh, video again. Thank you all and have a great uh, weekend. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. Prim. Thank, thank you, Christian. Thank you.